Introducing NASM One, NASM's ultimate membership program. Unlock access to everything your fitness career needs to succeed. Unlimited CEUs, free courses, access to our premium app, and exclusive discounts, all for $35 a month. NASM One is best-in-class tools, cutting-edge certifications, confidence in your craft, and everything you do as a personal trainer made easy so we can achieve our greatest goals together as one. You're listening to Random Fit with hosts Wendy Batts and Ken Miller, winner of a Gold Markham Award for Digital Media. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Random Fit with myself, Wendy Batts, and friend and co-host Ken Miller. Ken, how are you today? I'm great, Wendy. I'm excited for today. How are you doing? You're looking great. Oh, I am doing great. And I am really excited and fortunate uh, to have our guest today. And Ken, I know that you have a long term or long standing relationship with our guests. And so I am going to hand it over to you so you can let everyone know a little bit about Anthony Carey and why he's going to be joining us today. All right. Well, uh, you know, there's a lot to say about Mr. Anthony Carey, and that's why I'm very excited to have him on as as a guest, just because of so because of what he's done for the industry. And I say so because he's done so much when it comes to performance, fitness, and wellness. I mean, he's he's got the background, he's got the credentials as far as his master's degree in biomechanics and athletic training goes, um, but also as a certified personal trainer. He started his own course and he's invented his own his own pieces of equipment. So I'm excited to talk more about that with Anthony Carey as we talk about the Cortex Chronicles. For <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else but to say the Cortex Chronicles as we discuss fitness with Mr. Anthony Carey. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, Anthony, how are you? I am spectacular. Thank you for having me. Uh, well, thanks for being on. And, you know, after doing some research about you, I have not met you in person, which I hope I get to one day. I know that you've been in the industry for a long time, as well as Ken and I. And so when you look at the two to three decades between all three of us, uh, we obviously have seen a lot of things in the fitness industry, you know, changes and in inventions, innovations, courses, all, all the things, if you will. But in your like with your background and your history and what you've seen, because I think you started your company in 1994. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. And so <laughs> what have you noticed as principles and concepts that have been the actual constant from the time you've started to where we are today? In terms of the overall philosophy of, of how, yeah, how just in the fitness. It? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think what's been consistent probably more than anything has been uh, the ongoing challenges that we've had to aggregate a certain common common ground let's put it that way which is a which i think is a double-edged sword um i think that there's often a, a conflict between ideas uh which often brings debate and, and uh, a lot of good interaction at the same time um we have you know, we're tribal much like the political system and so that that doesn't seem to have changed may have been magnified now with the access of uh, that we all have to other other people's information on the internet uh, that wasn't there back when we started. A lot of it was articles and conferences and, and people up at conferences, uh, one saying one thing, one saying the other thing. But, you know, I, I think overall the growth of the industry has been very positive. I think the fact that um, we've continued to try to expand what we do as professionals as fitness professionals and our contribution to the industry has continued to grow and be more recognized overall the importance all that has been uh consistent but it's been sort of an ongoing journey that we have to continue so i, I want to follow up on that question wendy because when we talk about concepts and principle and 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 when and uh anthony you bring up a lot of great points as far as you know, you've been around since 94. So, geez, have you thought about that? You, it's 30 years. <laughs> I've since. actually been around before that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's before, that's company. before, that's before function first. And just, just a quick aside here. I, I, I pulled these, I just happened to be. Okay. Looking <laughs> so for those of you that are listening to us, I'm holding up a couple DVDs. If that doesn't uh, kind of date where these, these, this bit of information is coming 
from Corrective Exercise for Powerful Change uh, and Powerful Change Part 2. There was a Part 2 uh, mm-hmm. on top of that. But these, I mean, and the reason why I bring that up or I'm pulling that out and kind of just to demonstrate that you've been talking about corrective exercise for a long time, uh, well before it was scaled to what it is today. So what you're saying, Anthony, and this is where, you know, your comment on the the information that's proliferated in the fitness industry has been positive, right? And I like to think that, you know, from where Wendy and I stand with the National Academy of Sports Medicine, what we've done for them uh, when it comes to getting people to move better, getting people to move more efficiently, getting people to find strategies that work for them. You've you've done the same thing, but in, in parallel with a different strategy, so to speak, right? Um, to, to some extent. And then you know, so when Wendy's when Wendy put it in the way that you know concepts and principles, when it comes to how you work with people, right? So if we can just kind of narrow narrow that down that that alleyway a little bit, what what have you what has been a constant for you um, when it comes to okay, so since before 1994, and with what you've done with 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 function first and the pain-free movement specialist and what you've you've put together as far as the cortex and the cortex sit what what are some what are some how you look at the body is what i'm always curious about when i talk to you well what has been and i think one of the things when i first started is i always felt that there was a there was a, a missing sort of piece right there was this it was this really local view and then there was this really global view but nobody had at that point, nobody had really defined clearly where the where the gap was in between, and and that, to me, was a key to really um, really good programming. Let's put it that way, right? So we had we had one aspect where you could have people doing all this remedial stuff, and then you had the other aspect where people were being progressed way too soon. And I always felt that there was this really key part that we didn't understand both from a programming standpoint, but because we didn't understand the functional anatomy part of it. And when, you know, with the sort of the, uh, the look of how the whole myofascial continuity aspect came into play a little bit, that really helped with some of the connections. But a lot of it was, was uh, some trial and error and figuring out, and, you know, hypotheses that or theories that myself had or I grabbed from somebody else and, and tried to help. It was that missing piece was in the middle always to me when it came to how we're going to, you know, really make um, a sequential progression in the way that we address the body. And then, you know, I, I, sometimes I describe it as playing chess versus checkers, right? And and if we can, right. if we're thinking ahead and we're thinking about a little bit more three dimensionality and kind of what, what are the consequences of what I'm doing beyond the obvious? And, and that's where I, I feel like it's always helped me kind of put together uh, exercise programs for, for the types of clients that I was seeing that could be effective. Awesome. So to, to piggyback off of that, and again, Anthony, I'm learning more about you each and every day. You know, I know your main focus in your programming and what I've what I've seen, you deal a lot with quote pain or pain management and your program design. And that there I know that there's not like just one program that you can give all. I mean, that's one of the the things about us as professionals. We have to really individualize a program. So with all of that being said. You know, how do you if you have somebody that comes in and especially within our scope of practice, we always say, well, we can't deal with pain, but we can work with discomfort, you know, knowing what's leading to, quote, the pain of the individual. How do you work around that with, you know, the different scopes of practice? How do you do that within Function First? And how have you put these programs together to really help people? Yeah, well, if you don't mind, I push back a little bit on that. We can work with people with pain. We just can't claim that we're treating or diagnosing them right within our professional boundaries. So there's a lot of people, and that's actually the type of clientele that I've worked with for years, who've really already kind of exhausted uh, the traditional, um, all the traditional avenues, whether it's been uh, in licensed professionals in general, but they may have gone, you know, combined it with massage and, 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 and other interventions that haven't worked. They still want to be able to uh, live productive lives. And one of the only ways that they can do that is, is to get on an exercise program and move better, right? And so as long as we're not claiming to treat, and this is something that I've, I've been very um, outspoken about, is like if a client comes in to see me for lower back pain, I'm not grabbing the lower back pain client or exercises, right? I'm looking at basically how they move 
And then how can we use some of the neuroscience around the coaching aspect of helping them better understand pain and, and the difference between chronic and acute pain and knowing and, and sharing with them, I'm not a physical therapist, I'm not a licensed professional, I'm going to give you exercises. And what we're going to do is help you move better, remove mechanical stress from your body, which gives your body an opportunity to come up with some novel movements, uh, new strategies around things, expand that movement catalog that you have now and, and help you move past what's going on without ever claiming or, or, or assuming that I'm treating anything. Yeah, I love that. That's our theory too, but it's so much better when it comes from other people as well. <laughs> so. yeah. and, and, and that's a, a legitimate pushback that we could give on any, for example, physical therapist. Early, back in the days, I used to, in the day, I used to get physical therapists coming at me all the time. And I, and I would share with them, look, I'm, I'm just doing exercises and I'm not claiming. And if, if you had done your job up front, okay, and spent, spent the time with this person, et cetera, then maybe they wouldn't have to come to me. But I am just an exercise professional, just. We all are, Anthony. We all are. <laughs> I, I love that. If you did your job, yeah. they, wouldn't need to, they wouldn't need to come to me. <laughs> it's kind of the truth. Yeah, it right. is. It is. And, and, I, and, I, and I'm sure there's going to be there's a physical therapist, and that's not a knock on them, right? Sometimes it's a kind. Right. Sometimes right. it is, but sometimes it's a combination of the 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 uh, insurance setup. Sometimes it's the understanding of the of the of the their patient, our client that um, wasn't communicated properly. There's there's a whole. Tr trust me when I, I'm I'm extremely genuine when I say the the education behind the doctors physical therapy out there are, are, is mind blowing, and and their content. It's just sometimes some, it, it just doesn't work for some people, and and what we do sometimes does. Right, and, and I, I think one of the things with with regards to that subject of you know you have some you you brought up low back pain uh it's it's just i would say it's ironic that within the last three weeks i've gotten four new clients because of having low back issues and i think what a lot of fitness professionals when it comes to to somebody coming to them with a certain whether it be a low back or shoulder uh foot and ankle and knee issue um i think the in, in you talk about this a lot within your your educational platform and when i've seen you speak about the uh biopsychosocial paradigm when it comes to getting somebody to really fully consider what goes into how they're feeling and why they're feeling a certain way uh, you know would you mind sharing that biopsychosocial paradigm you know because we we tend to look at the body as okay this pulls this pushes this this shortens, right. this extends but there's a lot more to that. So I, I, I'd love it if you can explain that that concept to our to our listeners. Sure, sure. And um, I, I would bet that most of your listeners and certainly um, most of those the, the NASM community is, is aware of it indirectly and maybe have not put it together this because it, it's, it applies to weight loss. It, it even applies to performance in a lot of ways. But when it comes to pain, and because pain is sort of the, the greatest stimulus that enters the body, it seems like everybody um, kind of loses their marbles a little bit in terms of uh, whether it's us working with them or whether it's the experience of the person that's had it. But the biopsychosocial model is, is something that's been around for, for you know probably 20 years now in terms of really making its impact in, within the literature. Um, there's even debate among many of the pain professionals of, of the how much weight each of those legs of that stool carry but essentially the bio is everything that we've always sort of considered and learned about pain and it's the it is the biomechanics it's it's the biophysiology it's the biochemistry it's you know it's the inflammation it's the it's the osteoarthritis it's the it's the uh congenital malalignments that might be present it's the tight muscles it's the fascial restrictions it's all those things that we've always thought about right so that that's always part of the equation and that's why exercise is so powerful but the psychological, the psychological leg of that stool is also sort of what is what is the client or or the patient's expectations, right? Do they think that um, they're cursed with this because their mother and and their and their you know their grandmother had this same situation? Um, do they feel like nobody's listening to them? Do they feel like uh, it's not up to me to get better? It's it's it can be related. It can be depression can be part of that. Um, all of these different psychological uh, aspects that are part of the human experience are not where our expertise is, but it's our ability to actually open that conversation where they can consider it as a, as a, a contributing factor. And then the third leg is the social social pressures or social obligations. Uh, if, if I'm 
if i am got low back pain for years and part of my job involves me using my lower back and it's getting worse and worse, the the pressure of not being able to provide for my family or the, the need to stand at an event when I'm supposed to be a, a speaker or attendee for that matter, whatever, uh, the, the anticipation of the historical experience that I've had with my pain, I will, an expectation of that, I will start to produce many of the same physiological responses and psychological responses within my body in anticipating of an event before it even happens. So when we put all three of those together, and they have, they can be weighted differently depending on the situation that an individual has. But when you have all three of those together and you share that with your client, right? I've had, I've had men, and I'll be a little bit sexist, sexist here, but I've had men in my, in their fifties or sixties, right? Sit and, and actually start to tear up because they start to understand it a little better. And they start to, you know, they start to share how, especially like being the man in the family and the breadwinner, for example, and what, with this one case I'm thinking of where they start to tear up realizing that, yeah, that's actually part of what's going on. And that in and of itself means I'm, I'm not there to offer you psychological advice, but what I am there is to give you all these other options where we can start chopping some of the legs out of that narrative where you start to recognize that. Combine that with exercise, right now you're really an empowered client. So that is, I love everything about that, by the way. Now we should just record that and play that over and over and over again, just for everyone in, in the fitness world, enthusiasts, trainers, professionals, everyone. But, you know, what, you mentioned this when we first started, Anthony, and those of you guys that are joining us on Random Fit, we have Anthony carry on and Ken Miller and I get the opportunity to ask him incredible questions. So we're super excited to have him on. And we are talking, we will get into the cortex the actual cortex, but we're talking today about cortex chronicles and just an overall discussion in fitness. And Anthony, when, when, when you came on and you had mentioned, you know, obviously when we started social media really wasn't a thing and right. now it is, it's everywhere. We've got everything from Instagram to face, you know, Facebook and, you know, people are constantly on their phones. I mean, we're seeing a lot of issues just from that, but the information, there's so much information out there that's not necessarily good information. It's bad information, skewed information. You know, how, how do you um, kind of deal with all of that uh, when people come in? I saw this on social media. I want to do this either as a client or if you have a fitness professional coming in and they want to be this influencer and they follow someone <laughs> that's giving bad information. Right. How do you handle both of those situations? Yeah, I, I throw my phone at them. And I <laughs> <laughs> Um, you do? <laughs> I'm tempted to. I'm tempted to. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think a big part of of my journey um, with maturity as a person, as a professional, is to be empathetic, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that carries over on, onto the cli client side specifically, especially with those in pain. But uh, whether it's a trainer or a client, and that's part of what they want to share with me, the first thing I want to understand is, you know, why is that important to them or why do they see that's valuable? And then I, you know, it's, the other thing that I've learned over the years is I've, I've got to figure out a way that I can I can address both their needs and and their wants. And if somebody comes in and like they've been doing this exercise or they feel like this exercise is going to be beneficial, I'm going to I may figure out a way to uh, work that into their program um, as I um, or, or it may be slightly modified, but it, 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 a way that I can sort of throw them a bone, for lack of a better word. Um, but in general, I think most of the, the folks that we're going to see um, from a client standpoint are going to be understanding the surface level of knowledge that they're going to get from, from social media and, and what they're seeing. And, and it's enough to start a conversation, which can be helpful, right? right. Um, and, and when trainers do it, I'm a little, it's typically going to be um, kind of a, a newer trainer, right? That, that may be looking for different ways that they can can make an impact and leverage social media to do that and um they're i mean let's face it they, they may get a million followers but it's that's also going to be a surface level of influence that they're doing in terms of um you know people are going to bounce from influencer to influencer they're going to pick i mean i have people that send me oh have you seen this have you seen this have you seen, right and they're constantly and they're saving all of this stuff and they're in from their feeds and i'm like well how do you make sense of that right are you just is it the is it the throw everything against the wall and see what what works kind of thing? And so um, I think it's great for for them and for us to sort of uh, initiate a little bit of curiosity, you know, 
challenge our maybe challenge our thought processes a little bit. Um, but at the end of the day, we've got to be able to sort of justify both scientifically and practically, you know, why people are and, and for whom and for what, Ken, right? That's one of our that's our ongoing thing. And then and then when, right? So it, you know, you could have a great people say that to me all the time. What about this exercise? And I'll say for whom and yeah. for what? Right. <laughs> Then, then we have a then we have a more defined conversation about what you what you want to what you want to have a, around this particular move exercise application whenever it is. Right, because and that's uh, that's something that we always talk about, Anthony. It's like there's got to be context to it. Is yeah. is is what we're saying? It's like for whom, for what? You know, what's the goal, and when are you doing it? And that's and that's where I think when you look at social media, like some of these exercises are great. Some of these things that you can pick up, it's like oh, I've never thought about that. But then when you look at the caption and they're saying it's good for this, but then, you know, something I, you know, you and I have talked about and something I picked up from you, let's say, years ago is, you know, when you think about an exercise, right, you got to think, okay, what's the biomechanical effect? What's the neurological effect, right? Try basically find four to five benefits to an exercise because as you start to, you know, you start to create your catalog of exercises that, can help with upper body, lower body, uh, f- just for example. But if I can check off more than a few boxes because of all the benefits, then you know I, I I can make your workout more efficient. You know you don't have to memorize this exercise for that benefit, that exercise for another right. benefit. But if I have one that can cover both, right? <clears throat> so that for whom, for what, you know what, you know who's going to do it? What? Why are they doing it? What's their goal? And then when in that scope of time are they going to be doing it? That, that may not be the right exercise for you today, right. but something that can benefit you two months down the line if you earn the right to perform that exercise. Mm-hmm. So I love the way you said that. I agree. And that, that, that speaks to that chess versus checkers things, right? Yeah. When, when you, if, if we look at any exercise and, and, and this is what we sometimes do with some of our students, we say, okay, somebody says, I want to give this exercise for this. And I said, well, or, or I like this exercise. Okay. And, and we say, all right, give me three, four, five values or five reasons why, you know, the benefits that, that, that this client at this time is going to get from that. And that just makes you think a little bit more about like, oh, it, it's not a if this, then that linear relationship to how we provide exercises. And I, I think that's, a, that's just a great mental exercise for any of us to go through, even in a, even at a small level, right? Even for a beginning trainer, I know, you know, one of the, one of the things we often talk about is how overwhelming it can be the programming aspect for newbies, right? So, and, and, and that can help them, right? If they can, they may have a fa- favorite exercise. Okay. So give me, and you might, and, and we often make fun of new trainers that are giving the same exercise to 10 clients, right? They come in and they've got, they've got eight appointments right. in a row and, and, and eight, and, and a, a positive side of that is perhaps they are seeing beyond, you know, the obvious application that exercise, and that's why they're doing it with somebody. So, you know, any trainer out there, if you're new, take one or two of your favorite exercises and think about how you're always applying it, but then come up with a couple other reasons where it could be valuable for somebody, right? And then all of a sudden, 10 exercises become exponential, right? Of, yeah. of how you can use them and how you can modify them or tweak them a little bit uh, to, to meet the needs of the client at the time. So Anthony, that, that kind of brings me into um, your the cortex. Now, can you tell us a little bit, what is the cortex? What was your motivation behind the cortex? How long has it been out there? And just kind of give us a little bit of a background so then we can dive deeper into that. Because I think your product is really something can help people move better, perform better, they feel better pretty much immediately. But for those of, of um, our listeners that don't know anything about it, can you kind of give us some background? Uh, sure, I'd love to. Uh, it has been around now for uh, about 13 years, probably. Um, we're on generation two since 2016, but it's a reactive platform. It's the only thing out there that'll tilt, slide, and rotate at the same time. Comes with a hand rail uh, for anybody that's going to stand on it. But the, the driving principle behind it is in, uh, in introducing movement variability to the user. Um, no matter, and it's more of an environment. So, um, you know, originally when it when it came out, when people first saw it, they immediately went to it's a balanced product. It's a BOSU on steroids um, and no knock on the BOSU whatsoever. It's just an apples to oranges comparison. We often say it because it's a flat, firm 
platform that sits on three ball transfers that allow it to move. Um, and because it's like a three legged stool, using the stool metaphor again, um, it's there's always contact with with the ball transfer. So it's a very smooth, um, but it's a com it's a, almost an infinite number of combinations of movement because as it tilts and then slides and it can rotate all at the same time. So the idea behind it was how, how do we how do I introduce these variable stressors to the body, regardless of what position the person's in? Um, originally, the idea came to me originally as as if I were standing on it. And how can I get my hips and knees and, and midfoot and rear foot to do all these different things that I can't really do on the ground? I can try to from the top down. But if I do it on something that provides that from the bottom up, it's a completely different experience. And, and again, it's it's also most of the time it's going to be novel and new to the nervous system. So it allows us to often access, especially with the mobility access or mobility applications, it often allows us to access ranges of motion or positions that initially the, the nervous system would be apprehensive about. But because it's completely new and, and, it, and the brain doesn't recognize it as a threat or limitation that we can access some of these ranges of motion. And then uh, we can hit a lot of different vectors on the tissue, which is good for both the motor system, right? Because we, come, we, we start continually creating problems for it to solve, right? And then exposing the tissue to a lot more uh, positive stress. So both the, the joints aren't continually loaded in the same, using the sort of the same uh, osteokinematics consistently or and orthokinematics consistently. And um, we're also not stressing the tissue the same all the time because there's all this sort of built-in variability around the product and, and the environment. So, so Wendy, what um, to put that in in one statement? You got to find out where the closest facility is in Atlanta, and you just got to get on it. And I, that's what I tell everybody. When it, you know, I can't I can't explain the cortex as well as you can, uh, Anthony. As much work as I've done with that, but the best way to go about it, Wendy, is just to find one and get on one, and then and then try it out because because of all those all those parts of it and anthony i think it's best explained it's like you're just changing the environment that you're on you go from the solid surface and and i think when you first showed it to me you i think the way you were explaining it was you were in a squat rack and you were you were doing your exercise and then the the thought came what else can i do while i'm standing what else can i do to to turn this body on and and do more with the body and you just change the environment. Um, but a little story, and I, I don't remember Anthony when you first introduced me to the cortex. But and here I here I am. I thought we were friends, right? And, <laughs> and, and you said to me, "Hey, um, I have I have this thing I want to show you, but you have to sign this uh, non disclosure. <laughs> I had to sign a non disclosure agreement." <laughs> that, that was um, Early, early days. <laughs> that was early because I want I want to show you this thing, and and it, this was when the cortex was blue, that first prototype. Yep, it was just a prototype. Yeah. That was a prototype, and and there was no railing, and I think you had to put it in the corner so you can actually use the corners, the the walls, the two walls. You can put your hands on it, and then get on there. And I just remember thinking, this thing is nuts. I mean, you know, considering that never been on anything like that before. Or, but since then, Wendy and I've and I've talked to you about this before, and that the last four or five places that I've worked in, I've had the cortex as one of the pieces of equipment. And and I think Anthony's just, you know, you're just touching the tip of the iceberg when you talk about the application because I've worked in a physical therapy clinic for a couple of years, and I had the cortex cortex then. I was in a I was at a golf course working in their in their fitness facility. And I had it there. I have four of them in my facility now. Um, and then I, when I was teaching, um, I had one on site. So just from the standpoint that you can talk post rehab, or you can apply post rehab techniques, uh, mobility techniques, uh, conditioning. A lot of people don't realize how hard of a workout that you can get from using that piece of equipment all because of the challenges that it offers the body. Again, when you talk about moving in all three of those dimensions at the same time, it's it's a stimulus that the body's not going to experience on anything else. And I, I don't want to overhype it, but it, I think at the same time, it goes underrepresented 
as far as the capacity of well, the different ways that you can improve movement in the body if you apply it correctly. Again, for whom, for what, and when. Yeah. yeah. It all comes in together. So, Anthony, I saw, um, too, looking on the site, that now you guys just, and I don't know, I say just, I don't know how long the just released part of the, there's now a Cortex sit where you can, you know, to help people. So how does that work? I mean, is it something, because when you look at it, it would look almost like a Dynadisc and you're sitting there and I know it's completely not. So how would you explain that to someone that's asking questions about it? Well, it's, it's based on the similar, similar principle, which mm -hmm. is uh, the, that th the three ball transfers. And instead of it being flat, it's a little bit convex. So it's almost a little bit dome on shape and it doesn't, it doesn't squish down like a Dynadisc. So, I mean, that's, that's a fair assumption that, that we get often. And people are like, well, why can't I just sit on a Dynadisc? And it is designed for chairs um, primarily, although there, there are certainly movements that you can do with it on the floor. And we have, we have PE classes and things like that are using it. But again, the, the driving principle behind it is variability. And in this case, it's micro movements or micro variability when a person's sitting, because we get comfortable in these chairs, right? And and as we get comfortable and we sit down in those chairs, there's very little energy expenditure. And because there's very little energy expenditure, we stay in that same posture for prolonged periods of time. But if we're giving, if we're on something that's completely reactive, so meaning that if I look out the window like that, there's going to be a, a change in the position of my center of gravity, which is going to be reflected in, in the cortex sit. And I'm just constantly kind of working on that little intermittent um, balance process. So, and because of the convexity, it doesn't squish down, it's kind of gently spreads the ischial tuberosities, which eccentrically loads the pelvic floor, keeps pressure off the cossacks, and uh, provides feedback to the perineum underneath. So there's a little pelvic floor, there's a little low back applications in that sense. But, and, and the fact that I'm sort of have to be aware, we think it improves engagement when you're working on the computer and that kind of stuff, right? Because yeah. I've got all these little kind of micro movements going on underneath. And, and, and that's, that's actually beneficial metabolically, but obviously there's there's certain musculoskeletal things that uh, that we that if we can again dissipate that stress without it accumulating in any one position with physiological creep, that's going to happen within 20 minutes. If I'm just sitting slouched in this chair for all that time, I can avoid that. But it's a firm surface, so people will take it on and off their chair periodically throughout the day. It's not really meant to be like a, a cushion that you sit on all day because your butt's going to get tired from it. This needs to be implemented into certain classes, I think, for kids. Yeah. You know, like there needs to be like the science class where they all go there. So it's not all day, but when they get into that one hour, they have to pay attention or something. We're actually in a pilot program in Colorado with with schools for for uh, for different reasons. But and one of them, believe it or not, this is I found this extremely interesting was because they're putting so much. You know, with kids now, there's so much going on in the social emotional aspect of things. Is that uh, having these, especially these younger kids, kind of elementary kids, uh, they have like a let's call I don't want to call it a timeout area, but it's an area where the kids can go over and and sort of regain their composure. And one of the things that they're doing is letting the kids on the cortex sit because it helps them kind of get recentered and focused instead of like being out here with all the things that they're uh, um, stressed about or worried about. They have to they have to get a little bit internal, which is a, which calms them. And there's probably a lesson for us adults in that. too. Right? I love everything about that, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'd actually be sitting on mine right now. It's actually in my at my desk, but when I'm if I were to have it here, the the microphone would pick it up. That's what. That's the only reason why I don't sit on it because when we do these podcast recording, this is the longest I sit down. This is the longest I can sit down. But when I'm on it at my desk, you know, and it's it it really. I mean, I can I can definitely see its application from that from that school standpoint, and because. You can just you can just tilt your hips left and right, and it's, it allows that fidgeter to fidget productively, is the way I explain it. Yeah, it's it is it's like a fidget uh, fidget spinner for adults a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> fidget spinner for your hips. Um, but I also have one. But I also have one at my facility just because when it comes to exercise, and I know that we're talking more from a from a. You know, if you have to sit down, might as well move while you're sitting down and give the hips an opportunity to unload and get a little bit of mobility work while you're at it. But I, I have one at my facility as well, so that if we are doing seated exercise, which I don't do all that often, but if we're going to sit down, we're going to sit down. I'm going to have you move and rotate, you know, turn and give give the hips uh, an opportunity to move a, a way that they're not able to move if I just had you sit on a bench. So. Mm -hmm. Great, 
great, uh, great piece of fitness equipment for as far as uh, how I've been able to apply it as well. And Ken, you've done some really cool things with the shoulder, which on the, for your like your throwers and stuff, which is which is kind of neat and creative, right? When you put it on the wall and then it, some things that you can do with uh, humoscapula motion and stuff like that. It's pretty cool. Right. No, you and it's uh, contribution that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's about I mean, when it comes to equipment, I mean, you're talking about cortex and the cortex hip, but when it comes to any pieces, any piece of equipment, um, it just it's it comes down to just playing, playing around and and try to, you know, innovate through curiosity is the way I like to put it. But, you know, right. when we're, you know, you know, it, and, and those, those are two pieces of equipment that I, you know, I am never short on, you know, like, oh, well, let's let's try this, you know, or some can I do can I use it for that? You know, like client or one of the trainers in my facility will say, can 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 it can it work for this purpose? I go, you know what? I don't know, but let's mm -hmm. let's try it out just because it, it you can't pin it down to one thing or ten things. You just gotta you gotta try things out and experiment that way. And that's where I really love the innovation that you've been able to, you know, to go from the cortex to apply it to something that's a little bit more compact and and just. I guess applied for I guess different purpose in this case sitting for as a major example. Yeah, and one of the things that's warmed my heart more than anything about the products, both the products being out, is seeing it implemented by others in ways that I hadn't thought of. Like the the collective knowledge pool that has come around that is like something that has both surprised me and just kind of like I said, warmed my heart to see um, how other people have taken it and applied it, and where their creativity has come in, and I've and I've and the community as a whole has benefited from that. So it, that's that's a real positive from that we that our industry does a great job with. Yeah, for sure. And today on Random Fit, myself, Wendy Bats, and Kim Miller, we have a very special guest, a guest Anthony Carey, talking about. Now we're into the Cortex Chronicles. We're really diving deep into the products, but just all the 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 evolution, the trajectory, everything that Anthony's been able to talk to us about today has been something that. Um, I've learned a lot about personally on this, but Anthony, I, I, we could probably talk to you all day. I know you don't have the time, um, but I want to ask one final question before we end. Um, where do you, you know, what advice, what would be your key takeaways you would want to leave with our listeners, but then also too, what is one piece of advice for someone that is either a fitness enthusiast or a trainer um, in our, um, in our career? Like what, what advice would you give all of us? Well, uh, something I've said for years and is always and this, at least how it's worked for me, is that I, I found a specific niche that I was both passionate about and found the way that I could really make a living at successfully in ways that I could um, charge more money. But it, and at the same time, provide a service that I wasn't competing as a commodity with everybody else. So I think that's 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 part of the reason why we see some of this bizarre stuff on social media, some of this bizarre stuff on social media. <laughs> is we're, we're we're working for eyeballs right and or that's what most of the time we're trying to get it we're trying to grab attention for that so that we can bring attention to us and, and therefore our services and can we either make money online with sponsorships or that kind of thing or can we see clients and i think you know there's that's a that's a very shallow way to to approach a long if you're really passionate about the industry and you really want to make an impact over time i think that what you're going to if you're able to dial in a certain population or certain style of training that is your preferential about that also motivates you to learn more. You know, so again, if I can use myself as an example, I would really, I'd love to dive into all things about pain and biomechanics. Um, and that's what really, and, and, then, and then I got a lot into the, into the myofascial system and the relationship to movement with that. So pulled from these different things, but they're still within sort of a, a niche of which that I found very interesting. So it allowed me to expand my skill set and my knowledge and, and the types of courses that I would take and the other other uh, mentors that I had um, would allow me to be a little bit more focused, which then allowed me to be sort of known for what I did in our communities and, and the people that would come to see me. You know, I've always said people don't come to see Anthony Carey to lose weight. People don't come to see um, Anthony Carey to, you know, improve their sprint time unless they can't sprint because they're in pain. So uh, and, and then I would refer out after that. So, I, you know, and that's not something you can do right after taking the exam. Right. And, you know, it, it's a great idea to just start working with different people and, and find out what you like. But as you as you mature within the industry, meaning just the longer you start working with clients, 
you should, I would consider seeing ways that you can dial in what you're passionate about because that helps us as an industry too, right? Because people stay in it longer. It's, it's the, the, the people that initially get into the industry that are overwhelmed with trying to do everything for any, everyone. Um, they're not making money. <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why we have turnover in our industry, but if, if, if they can be passionate about something, there's a great chance that they're going to spend a little bit more time studying it, get better at it, um, you know, and, and not be a commodity for the rest of their career where they can dial into what exactly the, um, the way that they can better serve people, raise their fees, make a bigger contribution to people's lives that way. Awesome. Thanks for that, Anthony. I, and I, and before we sign off and again, it's, it's been awesome having you on the show. I just want to say that, you know, when it, when it comes to what you just said, right. Um, as far as looking at the path, looking at your path, find out what interests you, where do you, what do you have passion for? And then go down that road. I remember, and, and <clears throat> I don't know if you remember this or not, but remember you, you, you had this obstacle course that you would do on Saturday or Sundays. Yeah, I, I don't know how long lived that was. And Wendy, this is something I don't know if I told you this story, but this was the first, you know, I, I we were going over one of the logs when you just go hop over laterally over logs back. And I and I sprained an ankle. <laughs> right. I sprained my ankle, you know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to get fit. You know, this guy, Anthony, K, I don't know how I heard about it, but I get there in my ankle and you're like, you check in on me and you said, hey, what's going on? And, and then this was the this was the first time that I heard the idea that, well, my my ankle instability that allowed me to have that situation happen, what well, could be a reflection of my ability to stabilize my my hips and my core. And this was, I was like, what are you talking about? This, you know, core is, you know, the six pack, I got my glutes, but what does my ankle have to do with my hip, right? So I was like, okay, I mean, it, and it sat with me for a little bit, but then years later, and this had to be closer to 1995 or 1996, Anthony, I, some, somewhere in that time frame. But that's when you first, the, the, the light first shined a little bit. It, it was a dimly lit light on the <laughs> idea that one part of my body is related to and not dependent on another part of my body. And then, of course, as I study, as the years go on, that was the first I can remember, like my first working memory of that that, that interdependence model, right? Like no, no part of the body operates in and of itself. No, no part of the body is an island. It has everything to do with with everything else um, with the body. So I want to I want to say I don't know if I've ever shared that with you, but that was the first I've ever heard of that idea that. Well, my extremities are heavily related to what's happening centrally. And then again, as I studied more and listened to you more and, and just learn more about how the body works, that was the first I had insight on, oh, this is, this is how we should be looking at the body. And I'll say that that has changed the trajectory of my career and how I work with people. Well, so thank, thank you for that. sharing that. <laughs> Yeah, so a little walk down memory lane for us there. <laughs> and, and, and I and I was probably really arrogant in the way I delivered that too, right? Like, you were actually you were. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> but I but I appreciate that. that. I was like, I was like, oh, what? What's this guy? He says he's a certified personal trainer and he doesn't know. Yeah, <laughs> but you just you just you just put it out there, and just, sometimes you just you just have to accept that you know that this is how the body works. And I was like, oh, this this guy has a point. But I'm so glad that we've we've had our friendship for uh, oh, awesome. man, uh, all these years. But um, hey, Anthony, awesome. Uh, me too, buddy. Um, but hey, uh, Anthony, I want to say um, thank you so much for for being on this episode of Random Fit. Um, we've got to have you back. We'll, we'll talk. We'll have we'll have something else, something <laughs> more that we can talk. As Wendy said, we could talk all day, um, and we will definitely have to have you back on at some point in the future. So thanks for being on it's the show. The honor, us. guys. I would anytime I can add value to the to, to you, the team and 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 the industry as a whole, I'll take that opportunity up anytime. Thank you. Awesome. Right, and that, you. And, and that you have. So for those of you watching us here on Random Fit, thank you so much for listening to this episode with Anthony Carey as we talk about the Cortex Chronicles. So if you like what you heard today, like, follow, subscribe, download, rate, share. 
please share and comment. Let us know what you want us to talk about. We'll do what we can to get that for you on a future episode of Random Fit. So until next time, everybody, take care and be well.